Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host, RJ McCready. And for this episode, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the strange case of the Devil's Footprints from 1855. So as I said um, on my previous episodes, I've pulled out some of the uh, famous mysteries such as Crop Circles, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, uh, the Roswell uh, Landing. But I thought for... um, for this episode, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about something that's uh, which I think is unusual. Some of you may know about it. Um, I first became aware of this back in it must have been in the eighties um, when my parents bought home. Remember the old uh, PG tips? Uh, they used to have um, trading cards at the bottom, and one year they brought out the mysteries and the unknown which was fantastic um, because as a young RJ, I must have been about 10 years old, um, this was probably my first platform into the mystery world. I was looking at these cards thinking, wow, what's that? You know, and pulled out, um, you know, aliens, Bigfoot, sea monsters, all that sort of stuff. And then I picked up this card which had um, devil's hoof prints on it. And I, I, at that point I thought, oh, that's a... That's different, that's interesting, and it really hasn't been up until now where I've actually had a look at this case, and I thought it's, it's quite an unusual tale or story or unexplained, because when you look at it, it's a little bit of a scratch-ahead moment to think, well, how did this happen, and how could you try and pull this off as a hoax back in those times? Because back in 1855, you didn't have any... Um, social media or anything like that and to try and get organised with something like this uh, <laughs> I imagine it would be quite a task back then so um, but I'll get into all that I'll, I'll tell you about all the all the theories as I usually do with um, these cases so the Devil's Footprints 1855 England um, so it's a phenomenon that occurred in a very cold winter back in that time um, in East and South Devon. And today this case still remains unexplained, even though there are quite a few theories. Um, so on the night of the 8th and 9th of February 1855, um, that part of England and Devon, they experienced some heavy snowfall. And residents woke up to find a trail of hoof-like marks in the snow. And the hoofs were four inches long by about three inches wide and mostly in a single file and these hoof marks these prints they ranged between 40 to 100 miles so there's a little bit of a gap in the uh, distance there but that's what they're saying between 40 and 100 miles and it was reported in more than 30 locations across Devon and Dorset and the prints went across houses uh, apparently jumped across rivers haystacks snow-covered uh, roofs, high walls and the prints first appeared in the town of Dawlish and they stretched all the way to uh, towns as far as Dorset and it wasn't before long until this uh, news spread to the local newspapers the uh, Plymouth Gazette just say as one of them and also the uh, Times so before I move on, let's just build up a picture of 1855. So you would have had Queen Victoria on the throne. You had the Crimean War. Uh, Charles Dickens had published most of his famous novels, so a lot of people would have been reading Charles Dickens back then. You had Brunel, who was uh, designing the Royal Albert Bridge. So it just gives you a picture of what was going on in that time. And you also had like the uh, sailing ships trading across the Atlantic. Um, and I always think this time period, it's that time of the, uh, you, you know, when we have Christmas, and it's like that festive season, you know. And even now we have like uh, like the Charles Dickens festivals at Christmas and, you know, people dressed up in scarves and top hats and, you know, it's, it, it, I'm just trying to build out that picture, guys. And can you imagine it uh, back in 1855 with that heavy snow? And then all of a sudden you've got a tale like this where people have said, oh, the devil's turned up and his hoof prints have turned up. And um, again, it's, I always like to bring this in. You've got to try and put your mind into that time, whereas now we are 
we've got so much like social media where we can find out about these mysteries and stuff and today it's we know all about like ufos and sea monsters and yetis and bigfoots and all that type of stuff but back in this time it would have been more like we wouldn't have been aware of uh, ufos or bigfoots or yetis or anything like that at this time it would have been things like uh, witches and folklore and stuff like that and the other thing I looked into here is that it's something I was familiar with as well. Was that <laughs> the devil himself got brought up quite a bit as like a, a t- type of you know folklore and religion, all that sort of stuff. Um, even to the point where um, I, I grew up in a place called Surrey, and you had like the devil's punch bowl, the devil's jumps in a place called Ventsham. And these were geographic locations with um, dips and hill mounds and things like that where, you know, again, it's like folklore where people said, oh, it's been created by the devil. So for me growing up with these towers, it's, I guess like I say, it's the the folklore from these times. And yeah, could you imagine waking up (laughs) with that heavy snowfall and then these tracks appearing? And I suppose there is an element of... Um, as I've mentioned before, you, you know, you've heard of Chinese whispers. Someone says, oh yeah, they, these uh, footprints have turned up. And then someone else says, oh, they've turned up in my town as well. And it, it must have been at the same time a great story to tell uh, amongst your community. And I suppose I'm not... You know, this. a lot of people have investigated this case and no one can really come to an explanation. But... You can see how some stories can get over elaborated, and back at this time, um, over a hundred mile radius, I've no doubt that he's probably bringing some communities together because they all had something in common and bringing this story together. And there might have been a little bit of, well, I definitely, there were definitely the, the hoof prints in my town, or no, it was definitely in my town, or there might have been people that were trying to find these prints and they might have found something that was related to something else to say yeah well i think that 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 was the prince so you, you what i'm trying to say is i think that sometimes stories can escalate and i'm not saying it didn't happen i'm just trying to work out that sort of mindset from that time that's how i'm trying to look at it um but something really weird obviously happened and i think the other thing with uh, snowfall it must be difficult to try and hoax because you leave prints in the snow so if you was someone say like on some stilts with some devil hoofs to try and go over that 100 mile stretch in the snow in that time must have been difficult and to try and get organised as well at that time with a large group of people I'm sure someone would notice because if you was doing something like that at the night time, I'm sure you would alert dogs and people would see it. Because I imagine back then people were probably a little bit more aware of what was going on in their local towns. Um, so I think that's what makes this uh, case even more mysterious, is how did someone get organised in that time? Plus, with the planning and preparation, how did you know that the snow was going to fall heavy? I, I suppose it was because it was a cold winter, I, I get that. But um, it is a little bit of a scratchy head moment trying to work this one out. And the only evidence that we have today to try and investigate this case is obviously people's accounts, newspapers. Um, There's no photographs or anything like that. There are some sketches of the um, hoof prints. And it wasn't up until 1950, 1950 until this case got investigated. And that was the only evidence that they used to try and investigate this case. Um, and some of the theories here, you've got um, an experimental balloon and they're saying that an experimental balloon got released and the actual shackles was what um, dipped onto the snow. But with something like that, it, I, I have to say that if it was a balloon with shackles, surely people would have seen that. And even at that time, we, we possibly would have had like a UFO case. Knowing what I know about balloons with the Roswell case, I'm just saying, but, you know, back in those times, surely people would be sort of saying, oh, I saw some unidentified flying object. Apparently that was released by the Devonport Dockyard, and it was hushed up at the time because, I mean, it did happen. And I think um, 
It damaged some property, smashed some greenhouses, stuff like that. So I think Davenport at that time tried to hush that up. He also had uh, donkeys, hopping mice, badgers, cats, birds, swans, which are all plausible, I guess. And what they're saying is because it was so cold that it um, brought out these animals from their natural habitat and they were trying to sort of escape somewhere else. So, yeah, I guess that's plausible. But the problem is, is that people's accounts, uh, they've given a description of these hoof prints, which... I'm not sure whether hopping mice would be that big. I'm not sure about that. Also, a theory there was an escaped monkey from a local travelling circus. But um, the other thing, though, that people have invest investigated with this case is that it would have to be something over a six hour period travelling at 17 miles per hour in the freezing snow as well. So, all, all that gets put into account. So the one for me that would be plausible would be like a, say like a donkey that's walked al along in the snow, leaving hoof prints like that. But then again, I'd, I'd say that people would be looking out the window saying, oh, there's some donkeys walking down the road. So someone would come out and say, yeah, I saw some donkeys last night. Um, the other thing is, is that these hoof prints turned up in some unusual places as well, uh, along rooftops, on, on high walls, um, there was even a case where it jumped over a river, so the, the prints came to a river, it stopped, and then they turned up again on the other side. Um, so there's some stuff where you kind of go, okay, I, I kind of get that, but then you get to this, and then you think, well, how do you explain that? Which, <laughs> again, you know, every, when I've looked at this case, you kind of think, oh, okay. So I was kind of getting to a point where I thought, yeah, it might be this, and then you... You see the fact that it's it's gone on to, to a rooftop. <laughs> Surely if there was a donkey running over your roof, I'm sure the residents would hear that, just to say. So there's a couple of theories. There's a couple of other theories that I'll get into in a minute, which make this a little bit more plausible. But just hold it there and just think, there's, just put yourself in a place of a resident in one of these towns at that time, in the snow. And... The, the, these stories can be great for some people, but back at that time you might have someone who's religious and then it, there could be, well there was stories of then paranoia of people thinking that, you know, the devil himself has, has turned up in Devon he's left his footprints in the snow and people were thinking, oh my god, you know um, so for some people this could be frightening it could be even terrifying and even so, that a local reverend came out and tried to settle his local community by saying that the tracks were created by the two kangaroos that he had in a uh, private wild animal exhi exhibition. Um, but then this turned out to be false and he did say the reason why he said this story is just to try and sell his community so you could imagine that if it was a reverend coming out there must have been people coming up to him and saying look I'm really scared about this so he was trying to do his best to try and settle people but that story when I first heard it when he said about the kangaroos I thought well that would again that would make it plausible because a kangaroo can go at quite a distance whether or not it can do it in the snow because obviously they're from a hot climate um but that, that story was uh, debunked anyway. And you also had people go out in groups with hunting rifles and dogs and they followed these tracks. And there was one group who followed the footprints into a wood near the Dalish town. That's where the prints uh, first turned up. And they claimed that they were following a mysterious beast into these woods and they sent the dogs in but then the dogs came out terrified. And that's all that I've got on that story. It's only a little bit on that. So I don't know whether that, again, that's just, you don't know what's, whether it's just the local folk then sort of coming back and telling these tales to try and up the story a little bit. I'm not saying it did happen or it didn't happen, but I think, uh, as I said before, in these cases, and it's interesting in the mystery world, as soon as someone gets that, let's just say, for example, you get that seed in your head, you start to then perhaps maybe see things because this story is going rampant around this part of Devon and everybody's thinking about, you know, the devil's paid a visit. So everything that you see now, um, 
you can you can perhaps start to see things, which is you know it's a, it's an interesting thing how the mind works sometimes with that. And like I say, it's just trying to sort of part the real evidence to now like a sort of folklore story um, with the world of like the Chinese whispers, as I said. But then there's another theory where people have said that you had now i didn't know about this until i started doing a little bit of research you had the local traveling folk the local romanian travelers and there was actually a little little bit of a feud between uh the romanian travelers there was a couple of different groups and they were marking their territory and there was like different communities and the way that they tried to sort of deter other communities was a folklore legend that came from Romania, which I didn't really know about, but it kind of makes sense when you think about it, because in Romania you've got vampires. Now, this, uh, vampires is going to be another episode which I'm going to get into. But the Romanians believed in a folklore legend called Mulo, and Mulo is a uh, dead light vampire creature. Uh, that comes out every night from a dead man's tomb and uh, imitates a dead man's body. And the Romanian travellers, um, they never travelled at night time. They, what they had to do is they had to get to a campfire at noon to try and repel this uh, Mulo creature. And some of the um, travellers believe that Mulo is actually the devil himself. Over the years, um, some of the pure Romanian travellers have converted to Christianity and they don't worry about Mulo anymore, but there are some of the travellers now, some of these, um, this is where you've got the food between the pure Romanians and the other Romanian travellers. And this is where the pure Romanians have kind of got the upper hand with the Mulo because the other ones still believe in it. Now this is where this case comes about at this time, what they're saying is that they have claimed that in 1855 they created these tracks to try and ward off these uh, fellow travellers. And what they said is they got organised with 400 people all together and they prepped it up in 18 months. They knew the winter time was coming and they got stilts and they got um, footprints. And now the only, the only difference here is that they said they did this in Somerset which is further inland, but uh, they've also said that they can be sure of the exact location. But what they said, they said they did it. It went off without a hitch. And what they know is, is that they they scared the local, the local town folk. But that wasn't their intention. It was actually to scare off the fellow travellers, which it did. It did scare them off. So their their plan did work. But there is a flaw in this, even though they've come forward and said, yeah, it's us that's, that's done it. But surely if you had 400 people on stilts going through these towns, people in these towns would have seen it. As I said earlier, I think communities would have been quite tight. Um, people would have heard things, seen unusual things, seen, seen people turn up. Um, dogs would have been alerted. So it's okay, they're saying they did it. It, it, it does it can be plausible i mean trying to work out whether you're going to get snow for at certain times i guess where well, you've you probably had longer winters then and when winter turned up it was winter times back then um but yeah so it, it's one of it's one of the one of the theories and this account is in the Autobiography of Manfrey Frederick Woods in the life of a Romanian traveller uh, came out in 1973. So lots of different theories, nothing that really sort of nails it. You know, there's, there's lots of stuff which I would say is, is plausible, but nothing that really sort of, well, certainly makes me come away and think, oh yeah, there was definitely that. And I think a lot of that is to do with um, early evidence in this case. I think if you had, like what we have today, like, you know, we have phone um, cameras on our phones and stuff like that. I think if you captured some early evidence here, each town took the photos and then you put it all together and say, oh yeah, they, they all look the same. Um, then you might be able to get this case a little bit tighter because the other thing is you had different accounts from different towns. Some people were saying the, the prints were bigger, they were smaller. 
Um, but what is definitely a fact is that something definitely happened in this part of Devon because nothing else happened in any other surrounding counties, which kind of makes it that, that focal point on this area that something mysterious did happen and it got people scared and got people talking, which is interesting. Um, but this is not the only time, this is, it's worth mentioning as well, it's not the only time that we have found um, footprints particularly in the snow uh, one of the one of the other famous cases which I'll, I'll talk about now is another one that I'll get into later on with another episode is the Yeti the abominable snowman um, I think that first appeared in 1878 people started finding mysterious footprints whilst traveling um, you know expeditions to Mount Everest uh, one of the most famous ones was in 18 no not 18 uh, 1978 which was found by Lord Hunt on uh, his expedition to uh, Mount Everest which is that uh, some of the famous photographs that you'll find again in the uh, in the coffee books and you, you see all that stuff on the internet but something I'll get into uh, on a later episode then you also had a couple of cases as well uh, one which I didn't actually know about until I'd look at this was the uh, Spring Hill Jack uh, from London in 1838 where there's a report of a creature jumping on the rooftops it had like red reddish type demon eyes and it had hoofs that was jumping over the roof so could be another episode that I could get into and then you have um, other sightings of these types of creatures one which I found which in 2007 you had um, in West Sussex in, in England you had a sort of well-respected teacher and a businessman who were driving home uh, about 10 o'clock at night after going to a restaurant. And passing the wood, they became aware of a creature in the undergrowth. They thought it was a deer. And suddenly this creature tri- leapt out from the trees and they described it as a cloven-hoofed, thin-bearded, pan-like creature that um, trotted into the middle of the road it stared at them, unleashed a moo-like cry, and then disappeared. So you do get these reports of these creatures. I say the the hoof prints, the spring hill jack. So it is. It's in the it's in the folklore. Something I actually grew up with as a kid, and as I mentioned earlier, with the devil's punch bowl. Um, you you get all these landmarks across the world, don't you? The, the, the devil's canyon. There's the mountain that was in Close Encounters of the, the Third Kind, so you do get these references. Um, so coming to a little bit of a closure now with the show, I always say, what do I think it is? Um, so have a look at everything. Um, the only way I can explain it, and this is the reason why I've done some of the popular um, cases earlier on in my episode so like the case with the Loch Ness Monster okay so you're probably thinking oh my god how the hell did the Loch Ness Monster come into this as I said on that episode when you say if you did an experiment and said to people there's I've seen a monster in that lake and then you get a couple of other people that say yeah I think I saw something weird as well all of a sudden people start to believe that there's something in that lake so any sort of twig or ripple in the water and I've, I've heard this before with a lot of cases um, on TV documentaries they've done a science where people start believing that what they see is what is the monster and it could just be a twig I'm not trying to debunk it as I said before I'm only sort of putting some facts onto the table so what you might so what I think's happened here with this case, right, is okay. Is that someone's woken up in Dawlish and seen some tracks in the snow and they come out and say, God, they look like the devil's footprints, isn't that weird? And it could have been, you know, it could have could, could just say it could have been a donkey, or it could have been an animal that's sort of running across in the snow and you've looked at it. You've told other people, and then all of a sudden, other people are starting to sort of so oh yeah, I saw some strange footprints as well, and I saw some strange footprints, and all of a sudden, you've just got this story that 
escalates where everybody's saying, I think the devil's turned up and everybody's seen these footprints. So I think it could. So what I'm trying to say is, I think it's a case of a story that is someone said something and then it's escalated. And then everybody's kind of like sold into it and people thinking, oh, this is hitting the newspapers. This is making a good story. It's putting us onto the map. That's one of my theories. I think that's possibly what's happened. You've got all the other theories, as I mentioned. You had this like balloon, um, people saying it could be a fox, could be, could have been, you know, escaped kangaroo. And I suppose in these cases, it's it, you've got to take away and think, oh, you know, it's what you what you think at the end of. The day. But I was just putting in that theory which I've which I've seen before. But then, of course, I've always said, like with all the other, you know, episodes, I said it could have been, it could, it could could be a monster in that lake it could have been aliens that landed um in roswell it could could be a yeti and all these things it could be aliens all that sort of stuff so the other thing is you can't rule it out could it just been that the devil himself did turn up that night and uh did a little 100 mile trek across the snow now this is the other thing now even though i've said that there's there's a story of people and our imaginations. <laughs> it could just be the fact that he did turn up that, that night that night. And can I say he didn't? Not really, because you know, unless I've got the evidence in front of me, um, whether I can say yes or no. So that is my that's my final verdict. So there you go. What I th I think it is a story of people that it, it, it's become, you know. A nice tower. It, it, let's not forget about it. You know, it's it's. It, is there anything wrong in telling these towers? You know, people. You know, it's got communities together and stuff like that. I don't think so. And it's left a story and it's put, it's put Devon on the map. Back in 1855, the devil himself turned up, and I think this case will just carry on and on and on. And uh, I hope it does. You know, it's 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 a bit of folklore. It's a bit of fun. It's a bit of festive stuff. And um, I did say as well, because I, you know, because I do my other show as well. You know, I'm into my movies and all that sort of stuff. I think it'll make a really good film as well. You know, it, it would probably make a really good, um, like uh, certainly a sort of Christmas festive uh, uh, movie or or um, sort of documentary drama documentary or something like that. Christmas. So yeah, I'd, I'd, if I was a filmmaker or something like that, I'll take this one on. So uh, yeah, I'd like to see that one day. So there you go. The Devil's Footprints, that is it. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully there's some stuff you can take away. Maybe some stuff you haven't heard of um, before with this case or if you're new to it. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. And um, there are some other bits that you can have a look at on, on the internet, which I may not have covered, but there's some uh, pictures of the uh, hoof prints and detailed drawings and stuff like that. So go and check it out. <laughs> So uh, there you go, guys. Um, I'm going to close the show now, but before I do, there's a little bit of admin, so I'll just shout it out that I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows, um, including my other show, which is Cinema um, uh, Bite Size Cinema Podcast, where I release a, a couple of episodes each month. And... And you can find this show and my other show on iTunes, uh, Spotify, YouTube and several other players on the internet if you put in um, the Mystery Vault podcast. And I've also got a Facebook page where I'm most active so if you put anything on there, any suggestions for any other episodes or anything mystery or anything you like really um, related to the mystery world. And let's tell you what I'm doing next. So I'm going to be doing the uh, another disappearance, which is the famous uh, Philadelphia experiment, the case of the uh, United States um, naval ship disappearing. So we'll have a look into that case. So look out for that. It should be dropping next week. And as always, guys, keep it mysterious, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. here in this room is a well.
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.